posted the link to slides.com uh, with my deck. It might help. There can be a lot of little code snippets, so it might help your eyes a little bit to have those right in front of you. And also just put them on Twitter with uh, hashtag WCDOS. Okay. So at Buildium, I'm a front-end developer, and I work on the marketing team. So our marketing site, building.com, is a WordPress site. So I'm working on that almost every day. In addition to that, I'm doing a lot of things within our app uh, uh, geared towards marketing. Buildium is an app that uh, automates a lot of things for property managers. So maintenance, um, taxes, uh, there's a whole bunch of administrative stuff that uh, property managers have to do day in and day out. They don't automate all that in the app. So, Building.com generates a lot of our revenue. Uh, we, we get people to sign up for our free trial. That's our big goal with our marketing website. Uh, so, the title of my talk. Uh, well, before I go into that, first of all, a lot of these, uh, this concept of modular SaaS, uh, there are a few WordPress themes out there that embody this, this idea. Uh, the one that I've used the most is called Bones. These are all open source and on GitHub, so I encourage you to check them out. There's Bones, there's one called Sage, and then there's Underscores, which is by Automatic, which some of you might be familiar with. But they all, in one way or another, use this concept called Modular SaaS. So what does that mean? What does Modular mean? To me, Modular is taking something that is very large and very complex and breaking it down into small, reusable and recyclable components. There's this concept of programming that we do not repeat ourselves dry. There's this concept of some cactus sugar. How can we get the biggest bang for our buck with the code that we write? I think one of the best bits of advice I ever got about programming is if you are repeating yourself, ask why and figure out a way to automate it. Not just in your code, but in the dependencies that run your code. So that's not within just within your own project, it's from project to project. Are you rewriting the same code over and over again when you start a new project? Is there a way to automate that? Is there a way to make your life simpler and reuse components? So that's what modular means to me, and in the context of this talk, I'm going to be referring to this idea of recycling and reusing over and over again. Because SAS makes that so much easier for us when we're writing CSS. So, the next part, what is SAS? So, for those of you who may have never worked with SAS before, SAS is a CSS preprocessor that allows us to bring a lot of the components of a programming language, like functions, variables, uh, and modules, and bring them into our CSS to help save from repeating ourselves over and over again, to help us organize CSS in a similar way to how we organize uh, programming, programming languages like PHP. So SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. It was developed in the mid-2000s by a guy named Hampton Catlin. Uh, so SAS has a great site, sasland.com, I believe, and they have a great getting started guy. So that's definitely a really good follow-up if you've never used SAS before. So my goal with this talk, some of you may be using SAS already and know everything about it, and some of you have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm, and maybe have only written CSS. So my goal with this talk is, if you come across one of those themes that I mentioned and you want to build a highly customizable theme, I want to take down a little bit of the barrier to entry with using SAS because it is better than using CSS. And it will make your life easier when creating larger sites. And if you already have used SAS a lot, I hope to introduce a few new concepts that maybe you don't already use in your workflow. And also talk about the magic step of compiling your SAS into CSS which is a necessary step uh, in this process. So I'm going to go through, uh, you might have already opened up one of those themes like Bones on GitHub, and I'm going to go through some of the new syntax that you're going to encounter that you won't see in the right and regular CSS. So the first one that I love is nesting. So when we're writing CSS, if we want to make something Particular, to a particular page, we use a selector, a wrapper maybe, like on our pricing page. Right here we use pricing page, the link on our pricing page has this style attribute. 
and then I'm hovering as this style attribute. But already, we're repeating ourselves twice. And now you can imagine that over a large project, how much nesting, which here is uh, what the SAS looks like, uh, we can put a wrapper, pricing page class, and then our link element, style that, and then there's a little bit of new syntax here, there's an ampersand, and that's how we're going to append pseudo elements onto our selectors. So, this is great because you can namespace your CSS, right? If you have a large chunk of very page specific CSS that you want to write, instead of writing this pricing page selector over and over again, you just grab it in the pricing page class. And when it's compiled, it will look like this. The other great thing about, about this is that it makes your styles look like your HTML, right? We don't push everything to the left in our HTML, but it's much more readable and easy to work with when things are nested based on their depth. And that's exactly what's happening in the SAS nesting. So one thing I want to cover is that there are actually two types of syntax when I talk about SAS. This is an example of .scss syntax. The functionality is exactly the same, but there's an alternative syntax that you can use, and that is called .sass. So these are file extensions. The, the .scss syntax is going to be .scss, and the SAS uh, syntax is going to be .sass. Now, if you look at it here, I don't know how well you can see it down there, but there are no brackets and there are no semicolons. It's purely white space and tab index. So if you're coming from a background of Ruby, like this was originally written in, it'll be really comfortable for you and it looks extremely clean. It's like a lot like CoffeeScript, uh, analogous to CoffeeScript and JavaScript. But the themes that I mentioned, and probably most of you that are used to working with CSS, will find the SCSS syntax more comfortable. And that's what all the examples that I'm going to show are in, and that's what most of the themes that you're going to come across are in. But I just want to make that distinction. It's the same exact functionality, but there are two separate syntaxes. .sass and .scss. But, don't get too nesting happy. Best practice. Two to three levels deep is ideal. If you start to get seven, eight, nine levels deep, it can be very difficult to work with and understand what's going on. The other issue you can have is supporting older browsers. So you can think about how it's compiling, you're, you're going to end up making extremely long selectors. And some older browsers, like IE9, have limits on how many selectors you can have. So for both readability and compatibility, turn on over next. It's just the best practice. Don't get too mess happy. Okay, the next one component variables. So, how many of you like working with hexadecimal values? Nobody. It doesn't mean anything to me. When you say hashtag 0F3AB, that doesn't mean anything to me semantically. And I don't like working with it. However, in SAS, you can create a semantic variable, like blue, and then just assign it a, a value. And in this case, we're assigning it a hexadecimal value. And then, when we write our code, we just simply call that using dollar sign and the name of our variable. And here you can see when that's output, it'll output the hex value. Simple as that. So for most of the sites we build, we have three or four core key colors, right, of our brand. You know, orange, dark orange, and lighter green. And those are the colors that you're going to use over and over. And it's just so much more pleasant to work with. Much more semantic than using hexadecimal values. And of course, you can use variables for anything. You can use them for widths. Uh, for percentages, anything that you want can be a variable, just like a programming language. One more thing to mention here is that, just like a programming language, you can define a variable with another variable after you define that first variable. So in this case, we're defining link color with our blue color. And then when we call link color here, it will output blue, the hexadecimal value that we defined earlier. So this brings back, this brings up a scenario in maintainability. I've definitely worked on a project where I got an initial comp with some initial color schemes, and then there was a change. You wanted to lighten up the color, and that presents a whole new obscure hexadecimal value that you have to go in and change in every single place. But if you're using a variable, you can change it in one place, and it changes it everywhere, right? That's what we're used to in our programming language. I'm going to get into some questions at the end. We're going to have plenty of time, so write it down, save it. Uh, 
should have about 20 minutes, hopefully. So change it once and change it everywhere. That is a core value to you as a developer when you're writing SAS and when you're writing a programming language. You don't want to change it in every place. Just like you're writing a class in PHP, you can change a class in one place and that will uh, take effect anywhere that you use that class. So, the next highly modular component of SAS are called mixins. So this might be a little bit difficult to read down there, but this is just CSS markup for a gradient. But what I'm doing here is defining a mixin. So I'm using at mixin, that keyword, I'm giving it a title, and then two arguments. And these two arguments are going to be pasted in every place that I need to define the two colors for my gradient. So, look at this gradient, I and mean, there's so much crap to get through, right? And then if you want to change it over and over again, it's a complete nightmare to work with in standard CSS. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it once, I'm going to write this mixin, and then I call it on a class using the syntax at include, and then the name of the CSS, or the name of the mixin, and then the two arguments that I want. And I'm going to use variables for my arguments, because I know what those variables mean. So we use orange and dark orange. And then, when that is compiled, it compiles all of this, because it has already been predefined in the mixin. So if I want to change this gradient, change it in one place, change it in a bunch of other places, and you're done. So, Mixins are one of the most powerful components of SAS. And in fact, people write entire mixin libraries that you can import into your project and use. One such implementation is bourbon.io slash docs. So check out these docs. Very simple to just import bourbon into your project. You can even use a package manager like Bower. And that gives you a suite of mixins to use. You write one line, and for very verbose markup, like uh, like Gradients, it has mixins for that, and it's also great at browser compatibility. Who likes writing a bunch of CSS prefixes or remembering all the CSS, or, I'm sorry, browser prefixes? And who likes remembering all those browser prefixes? Nobody. So, a library like Bourbon is great for browser compatibility, because for things like transitions, uh, box sizing, order box, things that require four different rules just for, to get it to work on all browsers, you're going to write one line of a bourbon mixin, and that'll take care of outputting all those vendor prefixes. That's the word I was looking for. All right, another very cool tool that you can use that is based off mixins and variables is called Suzy. So these themes that I told you about in the beginning, clones, underscores, they come with a grid. And if you've ever tried to create your own grid, it's kind of complex. You have to calculate widths in extremely uh, tiny decimal places, all the way down maybe 10 or 11 decimal places. But Suzy, with some very simple configuration settings and a mix and a function, you can create your own grid system with how many, how many other columns you want, and name the classes whatever you want. If you use something like Bootstrap, I mean, Bootstrap does a great job, but it's made decisions about what the grid is going to do. And it has decided what the class names are going to be. And you are going to use that. You're going to adopt that. But if you want to create your own, try out Suzy. I haven't been able to use it in a project yet, but if you Google Suzy, Suzy Docs, I'm sure you, uh, just taking a glance at it, you'll see how, how powerful, how much time it can save you from all this rote work that we usually have to do when we're writing CSS. So, the next element, functions. So I have my mixin from before that I'm calling on the button class. And for the first argument, I'm going to use my orange variable. But for the next argument, I'm going to use a built-in function of sass called the darken function. And there are a lot of color and other uh, related functions in sass. Sasslang.com uh, is a great documentation. But this is a function that comes included with sass. So what's this, what this is going to do is you have darken, and it takes two arguments. It takes a color and then the percent by which you would like to darken it by. And when you compile that, it actually generates a new hex uh, hexadecimal value for you. That's also great, because if you want to fine-tune this gradient and give it a new look, you can maybe change that percent to 15 or to 20 very easily, recompile, and you have a new look to your button in one or two steps. And you can imagine that versus uh, 
rewriting all the gradient markers by hand. So, extend. There aren't too many examples of this in bones, but I want to talk about it because it is a cool SAS functionality. So there's a little bit of new syntax here that I haven't showed you before. We have a percentage sign and then a name. So what this percentage sign is doing is it's creating a set of CSS rules that aren't being applied to any element. Right? Usually when you write CSS, you have to apply it with the bound it to some class. You can't just leave it floating in space. In this case, you can. You can just write something and give it a name. And then I'm going to use the keyword for my big button class. I'm going to extend percentage sign button. I'm going to extend this. So it's going to take all this, put it in here, and then you can also override some of the settings. So in this case, I've defined the font size up here. But then font size of 1M is going to take over font size uh, 0.75Ms. So not only can you bound CSS to no particular element, you can also extend the class itself. So I want you to imagine this button actually being a class, dot button. I can extend, add extend, dot button. And that will carry all the CSS, or the SAS rather, that I wrote in the button class, and put it into the button, and then allow me to extend it from there. It's a very useful, portable feature. You can do something like create a series of, of extends, and that creates a module that we, you can reuse, you can modify, and, uh, and use all over your project, over and over again. Alright, so tying this all together, there's one last functionality that I want to discuss. And that is imports. So there's one last syntactical thing that we're going to cover, and that's at import. And then file. So, I want to back up a little bit and talk about the file structure of some of these themes. If you're used to opening up a WordPress theme and going to style.css in the root theme directory, in these themes, that is empty in every case. It just has some settings that WordPress needs to identify the theme, but there's going to be no styles there at all. Instead, there's going to be a separate directory full of various SAS components that are all semantically named. So in this case, we have uh, mixins have their own file. So there's mixins.scss, functions.scss, variables.scss, and they all have their own little place where they live. So if you need to make a modification, you know, okay, modify the color variable. I'm going to go to variables.scss. Going back to the file structure, this is what style.scss is going to look like. All it is is a series of imports. I think if you open up one of the scenes, uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. When I first started with this, it was kind of like, there are way too many files for me to manage. How am I going to do this? But, once you realize, what you realize is that this helps break everything down into really small, manageable components. You know where everything is. So this is at the top of style.scss. We're importing functionality. We're just not importing markup. We're importing functionality that we can then use in our core style sheets. And in the case of Bones, Bones uses breakpoint style sheets. So we have a media query, and in this media query, we're going to import 481up.scss. On all browsers, we're going to import base.scss and so on and so forth for our popular breakpoints. So, this is really helpful because you can think about what you're putting into base, and base is going to be loaded on all devices, so you want to keep that as light as possible and try and add as you go up, because, you know, on 1030 and up, probably going to be our laptops, things that have strong internet extensions. So it really helps create this symbolic structure to your work instead of throwing everything in one file. Alright, so I mentioned earlier, this comes with a caveat. You just can't start using SAS right off the bat. Because browsers cannot read SAS. So there has to be some step in there where we build compiled CSS. So, if you have never used SAS before, and you're 
eager to get going. What I encourage you to do today is get one of those themes off GitHub, use underscores, and use a WordPress plugin to compile. And my favorite one that I've used is called WPSCSS. It's also on GitHub, it's open source. And all this has is a path to your SCSS, and then a path to where you want your compiled CSS to go. And once you start making changes to the SAS files, once you hit the site, you use the PHP compiler to generate the CSS. It's great for getting started. Extremely low barrier to entry. The only dependency is this plugin. And then your configuration of it. But if you're amped about optimization and maybe you already have too many plugins on your site, you're going to want, or you, God forbid you're not using WordPress, maybe you need some other tool to get the job done. So I mentioned this at the beginning, but SAS is just a Ruby gem. In, in the Ruby land, in Ruby land, a gem is just a module, a plugin for WordPress. Something that extends the functionality of the Ruby programming language. So you, the directions are on sasslang.com, but you can just go in your command line, assuming you already have Ruby installed, and install the SAS gem. Then it's going to put the SAS keyword into your path, so you can go from the command line and it's SAS. Uh, and then enter a file, and it will compile uh, into a CSS file of the same name. So in this case, you compile style.scss. Because it's using all those imports, you don't have to worry about compiling any other file. And it will pick up on changes to those disparate files because of the import functionality. All you have to do is watch uh, style.scss. So, I don't know how many of you went to the talk on Git earlier, but if you're using Git, either locally or for deployment, this native Ruby gem is probably what you would use to compile the code when you push it to a, a staging or a production server. So if you are using source control in Git, you never want to include the compiled version of your CSS in source control, because it's just mashed together uh, you're going to have probably some extremely nasty merge conflicts if you're working with a team because other people are going to be compiling the rules and Git is not going to be able to handle uh, diffing those two compiled sources. So what you would do in this case is write a Git hook that after you commit or after you push, it runs a set of uh, shell commands. And one of those shell commands would be, uh, would be running SAS if you have the Ruby installed on your production or uh, staging service. Another tool that would go great to your workflow is Bolt and Drug, which both take care of SAS compilation. Uh, I did this talk a couple of months ago and I was all about Grub. I only used Grub. But since then, I've built a couple projects with Bolt. And I think if you don't have any experience with front end build tools or you're already using Grub, I think you should switch to Bolt and try it out. I found it to be a little bit simpler markup easier to use. This is also a build step that you could do on a staging or production server. You can push your code and then run a, a build, which might include other things like concatenating the JavaScript, compiling SAS, running any front-end unit tests, things like that. Uh, one final tool that's important to talk about is Compass, which is also a Ruby utility. Uh, Bones, if you go into the SCSS directory of bones, you're going to see a Ruby file. It's config.rb. And if you're compiling with Compass, uh, the configuration file is included there because it will generate a source map for your in your CSS. So if you're worried about where is this particular rule coming from out of all the style sheets that are in that directory, it will say on line 34 of 481 of the SCSS came this compiled CSS. So that's also very handy, especially when you're getting started and you might not be comfortable with the amounts of files that you're dealing with in a modular SAS setup. And that is also another build tool that you could do on the server uh, once you deploy. Alright, so that kind of covers it. I want to open it up for discussion or for questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, did you have a question there? Thank you. 
question, please. Who and I have a fixed values. No way and on the inside the course will have a gene program. So those are mostly a constant value. That's true. I think a better example of something that would a dynamic variable would be if you're calculating widths, you can use mathematic functions and then use variables as arguments and then return variables. So you actually can, and especially helpful with creating something like a grid, uh, you, you actually can return new new instances of the variable when running a function. Repeat the question, please. What is that? Um, Alright, so a function, let's, let's talk about mixins first. Mixin is not really any sort of functionality. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So he asked, what are the differences between mixins and functions? Because they look similar, right? They both take arguments. Uh, a mixin is really doesn't use any functionality. If you think about it, all you're doing is taking your arguments and then pasting them in and returning the markup. A function actually has functionality embedded in it. So in the case of the darken function, you're actually doing, behind the scenes, SAS is doing some sort of mathematical operation to calculate a new, a new, a new hex. So functions aren't really returning any markup, whereas mixins are, are purely for, for CSS markup. Another place where functions, creating your functions comes in handy are the mathematical operations. When you're trying to, to calculate grid widths, for example, uh, you know, functionality versus, you know, I think functions are a good way to think like functions programming languages, right? You're, you're doing a little bit of operation that you reuse over and over again. A mixin is it's a bit unique. You know, all you're kind of taking are, are these arguments and pasting them into some CSS Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So, some more questions. So, is Compass a compiler or is it true that you Yes, Compass is a, is a compiler. I don't have too much experience with it. Uh, I think it's just important to know it's, it's a big, big player in the Ruby community. So, uh, yes, and it, it does a lot of separate tasks, but compiling and SAS is one of them. So, yes, it's a compiler. And so, follow up on the other way you mentioned the WP as CSS. You said that's a plugin, so you just put that inside your WordPress site and plug exactly. it in. Exactly. And what if you do your development on one set of servers and then when you push it to your actual server, how do you end up? Yeah, it gets more tough with source control. It's really not great with source control. Um, but as long as the SAS is the same, then it will compile to the same CSS. I guess my question was uh, making sure that things are mapped properly when you would change. Um, yeah, I mean, can you think of a scenario that you mean? I mean, if you're pushing the same code through the compiler, it's going to return the same exact CSS. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as long as your, your SAS is clean, I haven't had any issues kind of between local and, and production. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to compile to the same thing if you're using the same plugin. So, um, yeah. Uh, just to expand upon my compass versus like, WPS CSS. Um, what we have found from our team is Compass has the lowest barrier of entry in terms of getting set up. Typically, when you're doing your compilation, your pre-compiling on your local machine, when you do something like run, it's a little bit more of a setup, but it's more powerful in what it can do. So, an example, our team not only we do we use run or gulp to do SAS compilation, pre-compilation. We also use it to concatenate our JavaScript files, and, and we do a lot of other tasks or other things. But we found that Compass is a lot easier for someone to just get set up, especially if you use something like uh, Foundation, which is a responsive framework. Like Foundation 3 or whatnot, they kind of got you up and running with Compass, and it was literally like, set up Compass, have some SAS, be on your way, yeah. and we found that with Grunt, you have a lot more you can do, but there's a lot more hiccups and dependencies and things you have to set up properly. Yeah, I would say like, if you're gonna, I, I probably should have ranked them probably in accessibility, but probably the plugins is the easiest way to get started. Um, the native Ruby gem, Compass, and then, uh, and then a front-end build tool like Golden Program, which have a lot more functionality, but are a lot, relatively more complicated to set up. Yep. 
I'll say, actually, I'm on a Windows environment, and I use underscores. And what I end up using to compile my SAS is uh, just a third-party program called Koala. And uh, it's, Koala before yeah, so it's just, I didn't want to install Ruby. Yeah. I'm not doing Goldberg Front at this point. So for me, that was just a really easy, it's a free download. And you can set up multiple projects, and then you just tell it to compile. And it gives you little check boxes where you can decide, like, if you want development notes in there, if you want it compressed. So while you're developing, you can go in development mode and get the full kind of expanded file with notes about where each line of CSS came from, so which of your yeah. modular files. That, that source so when you're ready to deploy, yeah. you can turn that off, and the whole file will be compressed. Not very readable, but, but better for the server. Yeah. So, and there's one more. Yeah, Koala is a great tool. It's free. Uh, there's another tool called CodeKit, which, do you know what the dependencies of CodeKit are? Is it Ruby? Mac. What's that? Yeah, I mean, you use Ruby, but you have to, you have to install it as well. Okay, yeah. So there's another one called CodeKit, which is a little bit more of a uh, GUI interface for, for compiling. There's another one called Freepros, too. Freepros. Yeah. And CodeKit has a build tool for it, too. So if you don't want to learn how to use around and stuff, you can use CodeKit. It does almost exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's another, another option I should add to the list. We're using nesting. Have you nest media queries? Have you done that? Uh, I don't know. I've been doing it with less, because my building uses less, and I, you can. Uh, I don't want to assume that you can do it in SAS. You can. You can. Yeah. yeah. In that case, yeah. <laughs>
Unfortunately, I don't know anything about customer service. So I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, yeah. Not sure. <laughs> Does anyone else know the answer? It's like an open form.